Welcome to the Synthesis of Yoga, the book that changed my life. We are on the fourth chapter, episode number 22. We will be exploring starting with the paragraph number 15. And the link to this chapter is there in the description. I would highly recommend that you follow the text of Sri Aurobindo so that we can enjoy and travel together. So in our last episode, we have seen how Sri Aurobindo gave an overview of the Raja Yoga where the Raja Yogins use the subtle body. They are looking at subtle body as the starting point, the point of contact with the divine consciousness. And uh, the limitation of Raja Yoga was its uh, excessive reliance on the method of trance, Samadhi, where you have your body brought to a peaceful stillness, a deep silence, and senses are withdrawn, plunged inward, in ascending upward into the higher states of consciousness and accessing the higher states of consciousness in the samadhi state, which eventually leads to an inability to deal with the outer world and its complexity. He used two Sanskrit words, Swarajya and Samrajya. Swarajya is the inner kingdom, Samrajya is the outer kingdom. So there is, through Samadhi, there is an exploration and mastery over the Swarajya, higher states of consciousness. But because of the excessive reliance on the Samadhi state, bringing that riches of inner exploration into the wakeful state, into the outer world and its complexities and dealing with that become very difficult. And that is a limitation of Raja Yoga as it has come down to us historically. Now he is moving on to what he refers to as the triple path that includes Jnana Yoga, Bhakti Yoga and Karma Yoga, the yoga of knowledge, yoga of love and devotion, yoga of work. Let's see how he explains these three different pathways to enter the higher states of consciousness. Paragraph number 15, fourth chapter. The triple path of devotion, knowledge, and works attempts the province which Raja Yoga leaves unoccupied. Interesting. Raja Yoga leaves certain provinces unoccupied. Remember, he also used the imagery of the king, the lord within, and the ministers, and the subjects, and how the lord is subjected to his ministers and the subjects, and not able to govern the kingdom. And uh, he's building on that same imagery further. He is saying, the province which Raja Yoga leaves unoccupied, so in our Swarajya, the inner world, inner kingdom, there are many provinces. And Raja Yoga leaves certain provinces unoccupied. And so the triple path of devotion, knowledge and works attempts the province which Raja Yoga leaves unoccupied. Let's see what are these provinces. It differs from Raja Yoga in that it does not occupy itself with 
the elaborate training of the whole mental system as the condition of perfection, but seizes certain seizes on certain central principles, the intellect, the heart, the will, and seeks to convert their normal operations by turning them away from their ordinary and external preoccupations and activities and concentrating them on the divine. So here he has given three provinces, the intellect, the heart, the will. These three are unoccupied in Raja Yoga because you are looking at Chitta Vritti Nirodha. You are bringing into silence. You silence the mind. You silence the heart. And you are into absorption, into the inner journey. So the intellect and with its discernment, discriminative capacity, and heart with its longing for the divine, and the will, its capacity to align with the divine will, these domains are unoccupied by Raja Yogins. So therefore, the, it, there, thus we can see the triple path utilizes these three uh, aspects. So it differs from Raja Yoga. It is the triple path differs from Raja Yoga in that it does not occupy itself with elaborate training of the whole mental system. That's another difference. This triple path is not so much occupied with the elaborate training of the whole mental system. So the entire Hatha yogic and like asanas, pranayamas, and the mental training of concentrated absorption, all that are not so much taken up in the triple path. It does not occupy itself with the elaborate training of the whole mental system as the condition of perfection. These are not the condition of perfection but seizes on certain central principles. These central principles are the intellect, the heart, and the will, and seeks to convert their normal operations, turning by turning them away from their ordinary and external preoccupations and activities. So our intellect, which is reaching out to the world through the senses, by its very nature, it is outward focused. Consciousness is by its very nature, the mental consciousness is by its very nature, mind by its very nature is turned outward, its sensory world, and trying to make sense out of all the sensory experiences, analyzing, discerning, making a picture of the outer world a mental impression of the outer world. So it is continuously occupied with the outward turn and the engagement. Similarly, the heart also, because the mind is outwardly engaged and focused on the external sensations, emotions and emotional being is constantly responding to that with the outward world outer world and reacting to it with its liking, its dislikes and all that. Same thing with the will. Will also is serving this external stimulus and a reaction to that stimulus. Our activities, our action in the world is largely governed by external contacts and a reaction to that contact. In order to react, there is a will that come into picture. So we respond in certain way using our will. Prior to action of the will, there is a response at the level of emotion. Prior to emotion, there is the sensory perception and mental cognition, meaning making, and an emotional response, and a will 
in action. So these things happen in a very rapid sequence. So we cannot discern when we are engaging with the outer world. It's a constant outward turn. Someone said something, something happened here, something happened there, and the newspapers and the news media and mass media, social media, that's where we are absorbed and we are reacting to it. So it is the external world and its conditions that occupy these instruments, the will, the heart, and the intellect. And we have to turn them inward and concentrating them on the divine. The divine seated within or the divine behind all things. So that is the central focus that is required. So the triple path utilizes one of these instruments, depending upon which path you are taking. If it is the path of knowledge, it uses the intellect. If it is the path of devotion, it uses the heart and its emotions. If it is karma yoga, the path of works, it uses the will. But turn them from their external occupations and concentrate them fully on the divine. And there is not much emphasis given to the elaborate purification of the nervous system, of the physical being, of the mental consciousness and the mental uh, capacities that is not given the first priority. It is about taking the outward turn and turning it around inwardly to focus on the divine. So let me read that long line once again. It differs from Raja Yoga in that it does not occupy itself with the elaborate training of the whole mental system as the condition of perfection, but seizes on certain central principles, the intellect, the heart, the will, and seeks to convert their normal operations by turning them away from their ordinary external preoccupations and activities and concentrating them on the divine. It differs also in this and there and here from the point of view of, the, of an integral yoga there seems to be a defect that it is indifferent to mental and bodily perfection and aims only at purity as a condition of the divine realization. So Sri Aurobindo is constantly looking at the whole landscape of yogic schools from the point of view of an, an integral yoga, an integral approach where both inner and the outer are considered and the transformation is considered and the evolutionary transformation is considered. From that point of view, he is saying there is a defect here in the triple path. That defect is this triple path neglects the perfection of the instruments. <coughs> Let me read that again. The mental and bodily perfection. So the indifferent to mental and bodily perfection. That is a weakness of the triple path. You are not giving importance to how to perfect your mental being so that it become capable of expressing, engaging in the world with its refined capacities. Same way, perfection of the body, the siddhis of the body, the capacities of the body and its nervous system, that is not given importance. These perfections are neglected. If it comes, well and good, but by itself it is neglected and not given importance. It differs also in this, that it is indifferent to mental and bodily perfection. I just skipped the line 
And here, from the point of view of an integral yoga, there seems to be a defect. So this is a very typical Sri Aurobindo structures his uh, lines. He says, it differs also in this. Then he is giving another perspective where he is bringing in integral yoga. And here, from the point of view of an integral yoga, there seems to be a defect. And then he comes back to the sentence saying that it is indifferent to mental and bodily perfection and aims only at purity as a condition of the divine realization. The basic purification of the mind and the body and the nervous system that is sufficient for the triple path. It is not looking at their evolutionary perfection that is possible. So they neglect these three, these perfections and consider purity is enough because the goal is to connect with the divine consciousness. A second defect is that as actually practiced, it chooses one of the three parallel paths exclusively and almost in antagonism to the other others instead of effecting a synthetic harmony of the intellect, the heart and the will in an integral divine realization. So that's the second defect. The first defect is it neglects the perfection of the mental and physical layers. Second defect is it picks up one of the three pathways and neglects other two, goes exclusively using one pathway to come in contact with the divine, use one of these faculties, either use intellect to come in contact with the divine consciousness or the heart to come in contact or the will to come in contact and neglect the other. And we can see that among various schools of yoga. For example, those who are into the path of bhakti, devotion, love for the divine and ecstasy of merging with the divine and that whole enjoyment of the love and relationship where we can see many of the poets of the Bhakti Marga, the path of devotion, laughing at the jnani, the one who are in the path of knowledge says, these are all the pundits who know all the books of the world, but you, what is the point in having all that knowledge? Have you enjoyed the contact? and the union with the divine. If that is not there, what is the use of all this knowledge? Or those who are in the path of works, they will say, okay, well, you have all your devotion, all your knowledge, but what is the use in the world of action? There is nothing you can do in the world. Can you run? an industry, can you run a country? You can't. You sit and sing, you sit and give talks, nothing more you can do. Look at the path of works. And we look at the path of knowledge, it will say they will be going deep into the knowledge, nuances of the knowledge, and say, what is this, you know, all your emotional moonshine of love for the divine, but uh, you are becoming more and more like a, an average normal person. I mean, the elaborate understanding of the universe and engaging with the universe from that understanding, the ways of the Lord in the world, how the things work and how you can master them, understand them. If this is not there, what is the use of all things? And to the path of work, they would say, no, you are rushing into work without really knowing the way the divine works in the world. The divine is creation is working from where the creation arose, 
creation came up and how the processes are unfolding and manifesting. You don't know any of this and you're rushing into the works and getting lost in the worldly action. Come and learn about the divine. So all these pathways tend to exclusively focus on their own way of contacting the divine and neglect the other two and in the process miss the integral perfection harmony of the whole being where your body is perfected your mental being is perfected your intellect is perfected your heart is perfected your will is perfected it is when these synthesis is accomplished we have a larger harmonious integral yoga that will be possible so let me read that again a second defect is that as actually practiced one thing is theoretically saying you enter through this and uh, everything else will fall in place all that will happen but actually practiced it chooses one of the three parallel paths exclusively and almost in antagonism to the others antagonism there is a certain opposition to the others instead of effecting a synthetic harmony of the intellect the heart and the will in an integral divine realization this is something very unique to sri aurobindo where he gives importance to all the faculties all the principal faculties and all the layers of our instrumental nature and he's looking at perfection of all of them so neglecting any won't be good enough for an integral yoga so that's just the overview of the the triple path he will be going into the details of each path and he has pointed at the the two defects where uh, first one is it neglects the mental being and physical being and their perfection and focus only on the basic purity as a condition to start the journey and the second defect is it picks up one path exclusively and neglect other and as a result there is no integral perfection across our whole being it is a partial perfection and a contact with the divine established by ascending from one well developed part of our being neglecting everything else the path of knowledge aims at the realization of the unique and supreme self so he is now picking up the path of knowledge how do you come in contact with the unique and supreme self the one self that is behind everything so the path of knowledge aims at the realization of the unique and supreme self it proceeds by the method of intellectual reflection vichara to right discrimination viveka so these two words vichara and viveka this is the key to the path of knowledge certain intellectual reflection through that you arrive at the divine realization so where you may approach it from the point of view not this is not the divine this is not the divine this is not the divine so neti 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 and you dissect and analyze and go to the source other is iti 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 that is this is divine that is also divine everything is divine there is nothing but divine so you focus and concentrate exclusively on that one supreme self who is behind all things so that method of vichara and viveka the reflection and discrimination is the key approach when we use this principal faculty of the intellect to approach the very question of who am i 
am I this body? No, I am not this body. Body is temporal. It is born, it will die. So that is not the timeless self. Okay, is my sensations, my emotions, is this the self? It is not. You discard it. And or my thoughts coming and going, is this truly the self? No, it is not. Discard, discard it. So you go on dissecting and discarding things till you reach the formless, timeless existence. It observes and distinguishes the different elements of our apparent or phenomenal being and rejecting identification with each of them arrives at their exclusion and separation in one common term as constituents of prakriti, the phenomenal nature, creations of maya, the phenomenal consciousness. So there is this phenomenal consciousness, there is a phenomenal world and its transient forms. Everything is clubbed together as nature and in Sanskrit prakriti. And prakriti and its transient phenomena is there within us and that is where our body, our sensations, our senses, our energy, our emotions, our intellect, thought, all that are various phenomenal formations of prakriti, the nature. These are all transient and it is also looked upon as maya, the illusory aspect. Though the original meaning of the word maya is to measure, to limit. In a way, the prakriti is limiting things into specific manifest forms. Therefore, the word maya is justified. But we are also looking upon the world as an illusion. These are transient forms. These two will pass. Here is a thought that is arising that will pass. Leave it. Here is an emotional wave that is arising that will pass. Leave it. Here is an impulse of energy that is arising. Leave it. There is a sensation that is arising. Eventually, leave it. There is body that is in gold. That's not you. This will come and go. Leave it. Behind all this, who are you? Who am I? So that is how it discerns, dissects, and there is the distinction between the prakriti, this manifest phenomenal world, and the one who is the witness, the pure awareness, the pure consciousness behind all this. So you need to eliminate the layers one by one, one by one, so that you arrive at the pure awareness, the pure consciousness, pure being behind all things, the eternal, timeless being, formless being. So it observes and distinguishes the different elements of our apparent or phenomenal being. Apparent or phenomenal being. And rejecting identification with each of them. In our normal consciousness, we are identified with the body, with the senses, with the impulses, with the energetic drive with our emotions, with our thoughts, with our imaginations. That identification is what makes us get absorbed in the phenomenal nature, in the maya, in the prakriti. So we need to disidentify. So it observes and distinguishes the different elements of our apparent phenomenal being. And rejecting identification with each of them, arrives at their exclusion and separation in one common term as constitutes constituents of prakriti, of phenomenal nature, creations of maya, the phenomenal consciousness. So it is able to arrive at its right identification with the pure and unique self, which is not mutable or perishable not determi determinable, determinable by any phenomenon or combination of phenomena. 
So on one hand, this method looks at disidentifying with the prakriti and its phenomenal waves rising and falling. Then as you are dropping them one by one, going into subtler and subtler levels, then you're shifting into identification with that which is immutable, imperishable, eternal, timeless, and formless. So there is disidentification and there is identification with that which is deathless, unchangeable, immutable. So let me read that line again. So it is able to arrive at its right identification with the pure and unique self, which is not mutable or perishable, not determinable by any phenomenon or combination of phenomena. Combination of phenomena is thoughts, emotions, all these are phenomena right? through the combination. This is not it. Leave all that phenomena, whether it is in its composite or in its individual wave, drop all that. You go into the immutable, that which is imperishable. From this point, the path as ordinarily followed leads to the rejection of the phenomenal world from the consciousness as an illusion and the final emergence without return of the individual soul in the Supreme. It is this rejection of the outer layers to go deep into the Supreme Self that is behind all things and identification with that that leads to the realization or this experience that the whole world is an illusion. Only that self is true. So the very famous line that we hear again and again quoted across Indian traditions, Shankaracharya's, Adi Shankaracharya's lines, Brahma Satyam Jagat Mithya, the Brahman, that absolute self, the formless, eternal, immutable self, that is what the truth is, that is what is true. Jagat, the manifest world, is mithya, an illusion. And this separation and this realization is where it will culminate. When you follow the path of knowledge. So from this point, the path as ordinarily followed leads to the rejection of the phenomenal world from the consciousness as an illusion and the final emergence without return of the individual soul in the Supreme. So the individual soul eventually merges with that eternal immutable self without return. So you are done with your cycles of rebirth. You have completed your project birth and gone back to the self, original self. But the question still would remain, then what is the reason for manifesting this world? Is it to find a way to get out of the world? Logically not making sense, right? But this had been the dominant philosophy for a very long time across India and the rejection of the manifest world as an illusion, as a mithya, as a maya, and that which is formless, eternal, that is the only reality, unchangeable, immutable, and get into that. This had been one of the tendencies, an excessive focus on that had its consequence in India. So from this point, the path as ordinarily followed leads to the rejection of the phenomenal world from the consciousness as an illusion and the final emergence without return of the individual soul in the Supreme. So that's where the 
path of knowledge leads. But this exclusive consummation is not the sole or inevitable result of the path of knowledge. That's another interesting observation. It is not the inevitable end. It is one of the possibilities that exclusive consummation, that union with the divine consciousness, which is excluding the manifest world and merging purely with the formulas, that is not the only inevitable result. So, but this exclusive consummation is not the soul or inevitable result of the path of knowledge. Let's see what are the other aspects of it. For followed more largely and with a less individual aim. The method of knowledge may lead to an active conquest of the cosmic existence for the divine, no less than to a transcendence. So there is individual aim. Yoga had been largely individualistic. An individual finding individual's liberation and merging with the divine. That had been a framework that was a tap that was that has evolved over many, many millennia. It need not be this individualistic aim. So followed more largely and with a less individual aim. If it is less individual aim, then what is the next possibility? The method of knowledge may lead to an active conquest of the cosmic existence. An active conquest of the cosmic existence. This is where the Samrajya coming into the place. The larger outer world. Now here he is extending it into the cosmic existence not just terrestrial existence on earth, but a cosmic existence for the divine, no less than to a transcendence. So the conquest for the divine of the cosmic existence, not only entering into that transcendence, but also the cosmic manifestation and mastery and action in the cosmic manifestation. These are possibilities even in the path of knowledge. But then aim is, aim must be less individualistic an aim. It is not about the individual merging with the transcendence, but there is something beyond the aim of the divine in the world is to be brought into that picture. An active conquest of the cosmic existence for the divine, no less than to a transcendence. The point of this departure is the realization of the Supreme Self, not only in one's own being, but in all beings. So this is something very critically important realizations. One is to go inward and discover the self that is formless and manifest transcendent, which has nothing to do with this cosmic existence, this manifest world, this phenomenal world. It has its timeless existence. It is never born, never died. It's eternal. That's one. And you see that you are merging with that, into that, and that alone exists. And then the whole phenomenal world is Maya. On the other hand, it is possible to arrive at the realization that all the forms of existence, the manifest world, all beings, entire existence, behind every form, it is that which is 
immutable and eternal, is the inhabitant of all these world of forms. So you realize not only within oneself, but in everything, everywhere. This is where it's not only in one's own being, but in all beings. And finally, the realization of even the phenomenal aspects of the world as a play of the divine consciousness and not something entirely alien to its true nature. So we mistake the formless existence that is timeless, beyond space, beyond time, eternal, it to be the true nature. It is in one poise, but at the same time, there is the other poise where there is this play of creation. This eternal self, the supreme self, is playing with itself in the manifestation as a multiplicity of creation. And that aspect is what is possible to realize if the aim of yoga considers that too as part of the aim. That's why Sri Aurobindo distinguishes two things. One is the method of arriving at realization. The second is the aim of realization. What is it that you want to realize? Is it your individual liberation? That, is that a name? It can be a name. It is, if it can go beyond individual liberation, also to see the entire manifest world, the phenomenal world, and your prakriti, and evolutionary process in it, is a play of the creation. The creator is playing through that and realizing, divine realizing itself, itself in this phenomenal world, if that too is an aim of yoga, then the method also need to be appropriate that enables that realization in the manifest world. So that's the possibility. So the point of departure is the realization of the Supreme Self, not only in one's own being, but in all beings. And finally, the realization of even the phenomenal aspects of the world as a play of the divine consciousness and not something entirely alien to its true nature. So this manifest world is not something that is alien to its true nature. It is itself manifesting as this world and there is a purpose to it and there is a play in it. And on the basis of this realization, a yet further enlargement is possible. So when we realize that the divine consciousness is also inhabiting all forms here in this manifest world, from that realization comes another enlargement of yoga. The conversion of all forms of knowledge, however mundane, into the activities of divine consciousness, utilizable for the perception of the one and unique object of knowledge, both in itself and through the play of its forms and symbols. Here is where we see, we can see there are two branches in the path of knowledge. One path is neti neti, that is not this, not this, not this. That is, you are stripping off the phenomenal world. I'm not the body, I'm not the senses, I'm not the energy, I'm not the emotions, I'm not the thought, imagination. You're removing the layers of the phenomenal world to go to the unmanifest formulas. That is the path of rejection, negation, neti neti. The other is iti, iti, iti. This body is also the divine. Every other body in this world is also the divine. Every little thing in the manifestation is also the divine. The inhabitant behind all forms, isha vasyam idam sarvam, yat kincha jagatyam jagat. The isha vasya is saying, this world of forms 
every little form, even the tiniest, is inhabited by the divine. Having known this, enjoy the world. So that is the other path of knowledge, when knowledge also sees the world as the divine. And from there comes the whole understanding of the how the formulas flows into manifestation, works through different layers of creation, all the way to materialization of things. And the method of manifestation, everything will become visible to the path of knowledge. Not only the journey into the formulas, but also from the formulas into the manifestation of forms, the play of the divine. So that is a larger scope of this approach. So on the basis of this realization, a yet further enlargement is possible. The conversion of all forms of knowledge, whatever be the forms of knowledge, they can be converted into this one object of knowledge, that is the divine's manifestation. However mundane, into activities of the divine consciousness, utilizable for the perception of the one and unique object of knowledge. What is the object of knowledge? Even the knowledge of the world. Whatever mundane field you are in, you are looking at from the point of view how the divine consciousness manifests in this mundane context. The object of knowledge will be always the divine who is inhabiting every little thing. Yet kincha jagatyam jagat. Tiniest of the particle is also an inhabitation of the divine. And we can see in one of Sri Aurobindo's poems, it's called electron, where he refers to the electron as the tiny temples of eternity. Times tiny temples of eternity uh, upon which Shiva is riding. That's how even the whole creative process as the dance of the divine consciousness, from the tiniest particles to the clustering of the particles to the living life forms to the clustering of people into the social evolution to the social development, cycles of social development, all that will become visible through the eye of the divine consciousness. Object of knowledge is the divine how the divine manifests through all these flows of pathways of manifestation. So utilizable for the perception of the one and unique object of knowledge, both in itself and through the play of its forms and symbols. You also realize the manifest world is essentially, everything is a symbol, symbolic expression of the divine consciousness that is behind. Such a method might well lead to the elevation of the whole range of human intellect and perception to the divine level, to its spiritualization and to the justification of the cosmic travail of knowledge in humanity. So such a method would eventually lead to the this elevation of whole range of human intellect and perception to the divine level. So if we look at the way the science is progressing, initially science looked at everything as nothing but material phenomena, then so that all the material particles arise from a formless energy source and manifest as a particle and coalesce and condense into matter. And now, Increasingly, there is an understanding that the observer is somehow involved in the creative process. Somehow we are determining what we will be observing. And there is a field that is beyond time and space, beyond the manifest world, there is something else. There is consciousness, but it is still in the early stages of research and understanding to see how one underlying consciousness transmits itself, translates itself into the manifest world. 
so the subject object duality will eventually end and there is one continuity of one consciousness is at once the subject and the object and we are gradually moving towards it in ancient india this knowledge was already explored and meticulously mapped how the subjective realization and objective manifestation and these two sides are the two movements of the same thing that's where the integral knowledge come into picture so the path of knowledge will eventually when it is integral leads to this understanding that one consciousness supreme being supreme self how that manifest in the apparent phenomenal world and its process of manifestation so everything that is otherwise mundane will reveal the indwelling self behind all things so that's a promise of an integral knowledge such a method might well lead to the elevation of the whole range of human intellect and perception to the divine level to its spiritualization and to the justification of the cosmic travail of knowledge in humanity we are endowed with the faculty of intellect through which we are exploring the world that very travail of the knowledge in humanity our capacity to know it will be pushed into its eventual culmination in knowing that which is worthy of knowing that is the divine self in all things and that's where we are being evolutionarily pushed gradually nudged into realize and it is inevitable that science too will come to that deeper conscious understanding that will be the space where the science and spirituality will merge together when the subjective knowledge and objective knowledge will come together para vidya and apara vidya in ancient traditional vocabulary of sanskrit the knowledge of the supreme self and the knowledge of the world they come together so that's the promise so such a method might well leads to the elevation of the whole range of human intellect and perception to the divine level to its spiritualization and to the justification of the cosmic travail of knowledge in humanity so this is a beautiful promise of the path of knowledge if that path is not too exclusively individualistic liberation centered but it is also embracing the manifest world and the divine purpose in the world if that is set as its aim then both the formulas and form come together and the entire process in between will be embraced that will be an integral knowledge towards which it can potentially move if it is able to get out of the exclusive preoccupation with the idea that the world is mithya an illusion only the self is real if it can turn things around there is an integral knowledge possible so with that we are coming to the end of this path of knowledge and this episode so kindly share your views your perceptions your feedback not just for improvement of this podcast but also your understanding of it and your views your uh, aha moments that will give me a lot more inspiration so looking forward to hear your words your participation see you next wednesday